Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Stephen, and I'll be speaking with Professor Royce Lee from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience. Professor Lee is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience who holds a bachelor's degree and an MD from Northwestern and has been at UChicago since 2001. He's here today to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Lee. I'm like, glad to be here. Yeah, it's it's great to have you. Um, So, uh, yeah, just to start off, could you give us an overview of your career path from, uh, you know, your high school and college years towards uh, where you are now? W- what was your path for, from college to UChicago and uh, what institutions have you, you know, stopped at along the way? Yeah, sure. So um, it was a fairly direct path, I would say. Um, I went to high school in upstate New York. I came to Evanston, Illinois for undergraduate at Northwestern University. I was uh, a double major of sorts, so I wasn't sure if I was going to become a writer or a doctor. So I kind of hedged and tried to study a little bit about uh, of both and uh, was a poetry writing major. That was my main focus. Oh, okay. Uh, but then went to medical school. Uh, I was part of an accelerated program. So undergraduate was brief. It was three years. Uh, and then went into med school. And in med school, the beginning of med school, I was always pretty sure if I went into medicine, it would be psychiatry. Mm-hmm. Because my, my mother was a psychiatrist. I'd been exposed to it. And psychiatry seemed to have uh, the kind of left and right, right brain topics that I was just intrinsically interested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I had a early rotation in, in med school in psychiatry that I didn't like so much, I got to say, and thought, well, maybe not. But then at the very end of med school, I did another rotation in psychiatry and had a completely different experience. And then I was reassured that, OK, that is that is the right way to go. Um, <laughs> so I uh, applied for psychiatry residency. Uh, at the time, I wanted to stay in Chicago and I went to Rush. Uh, university for my general adult psychiatry residency. At the time, uh, Rush had a reputation of um, being excellent at psychopharmacology, which was then a kind of growing interest in psychiatry. It'd always been there, but this was in the in the 90s um, with a, a few new medications with kind of interesting new mechanisms of action. Uh, that that's was a kind of optimistic time in um, biological psychiatry. Um, And then at the end of psychiatry residency, I thought my academic pathway had finally come to a close and I was on the runway ramp. And then it drew me back in academia when my um, I'd already accepted a, a job that was kind of a hybrid job. So my Residency director uh, pointed out a job opening at the University of Chicago and told me, you really should apply. So I did and uh, have been at the University of Chicago ever since. So that was uh, 2000 to 2000 to 2001. Uh, and so I've been here since then. OK, just, uh, you know, to to make it clear to our listeners, um, how would you explain to a lay person, um, you know, wh- what you study and teach now, and what your current research interests are? Yeah. Uh, so most of my activity as a psychiatrist is focused on uh, that overlapping area of psychological trauma and what we call personality disorders. Personality disorders are, we can think of them as somewhat trait-like expressions of behavior, thoughts, and feelings. Uh, trauma refers to things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other behavioral effects of intense psychological distress or exposure to life-threatening events. Okay, so you mentioned that um, even when you were in college, um, you had this passion and, and interest in writing. Um, so, you know, when you were young, maybe like high school, middle school years, uh, what did you think you were going to do? Was it was it always between writing and psychiatry or like, you know, what, what were your sort of expectations? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I, honestly, I think my parents always wanted me to go into medicine and I understood why they wanted that. But, you know, I, of course, had a kind of rebellious streak. I wanted to discover for myself what I wanted to do. 
and everything was fine with medicine. I was good at science. I liked it. I thought it was very interesting. The only issue was that uh, I was also really interested in music, writing, literature, and the arts. Uh, and so one odd thing about me growing up is I was a compulsive drawer, mm. you know, so much so that in middle school, the principal had to call my parents in and uh, tell them that I was no longer allowed to draw at school because <laughs> I, I, it was getting in the way, apparently, of schoolwork. Uh, so I was always just naturally drawn to um, kind of right brain, you might call it that, kind of activities. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, poetry seemed like a kind of respectable way to study that in college. I don't know if I had an end game in sight, but uh, I thought maybe I would, you know, publish some kind of writing and maybe it could have been poetry. And I liked how uh, poetry accessed mental parts of our mental life that otherwise might be not accessible. And I always thought that was really interesting. And in that way, there was early on an overlap in my interests in poetry. And I think some interest in mental, mental illness combined with, I guess, what you could call psychology and neuroscience, basically, you know, how our minds work. So I think that's sort of the backstory for why poetry. Okay, yeah, that's I see how those two interests are related, uh, even though you know at first they they don't seem to be, but yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Um, okay, so and, you know once you had decided uh, to to go down this path, um, med school and, and eventually psychiatry, were, you, were there any particular people who um, supported you? Uh, you know through the the more challenging moments of that. Oh, absolutely. So you know I think through all of these training experiences. Uh, training directors have a really outsized role in this. So it's a little different from high school, I suppose. Adult learning is a, a little bit different, right? Um, it's, it's more independent. Evaluation does not play quite so important as a role. And the idea of mentorship uh, becomes I th more formalized, uh, I would say, in these later stages of training. And you know, mentorship is a is a combination of kind of modeling behaviors, values, and approaches that your mentee wants to emulate, uh, but also maybe something like empathy or you know understanding the person being supervised and knowing kind of what works. So, <laughs> I think my I you know I really credit my residency director, and over the years I've come to appreciate some of his. Uh, and I, I assumed they were intentional, uh, some of his techniques. One of them uh, was a curious one, which was to overlook some of my faults. Now, I knew he I knew he knew them because, you know, we would have a discussion about them at some time. Those would not be the first things that would come up. Uh, so that was curious. And uh, I would say kind of confidence building in a way. I You know, to put this in context... Uh, you know, by the time you've gone through these different levels of training, uh, you know, when you're at, in a residency, everybody's done well on tests, right? Everybody's proven that they can, you know, do the standardized exams and work hard and show up and be consistent. Right. And so, uh, you know, sometimes people will use the term imposter syndrome. I would just call it mediocrity. Like at, at a certain level, your specialness is no, no longer something that's going to motivate you. It's got to be something else. And I think in that context, right, uh, it's a little bit different from, let's say, in high school where, you know, maybe you, you want everything pointed out, right? You want to learn quickly. At that stage, the, the kind of deficits or the things to improve on, they're probably kind of minor, but maybe important, right? And so I think uh, the way I think about this, it's, it's a way of kind of matching the teaching style to the situation, right? Where if you have somebody who's over, already kind of overly sensitive and maybe feeling quite mediocre, mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it's helpful to know that somebody will uh, momentarily overlook, you know, relatively small uh, a problem and, you know, focus on what's working. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, um, I think you referenced the point at which 
you know, you, you made a career decision that really set you on the track for academia versus practicing psychiatry, you know, just uh, from a doctor's office or whatever. Um, can you describe that decision and, and what went into it? Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, the word decision there is interesting, right? Cause that's <laughs> just a kind of, um, weighing of pros and cons and rational free will based, um, <laughs> process with a, with an outcome and a, a fork in the road. And in fact, the process was, of course, quite organic. And um, the o organic part would be that, although outwardly in residency, I was saying things like, I've had enough of that. I'm done. You know, I've been in school and around institutions for so long. I think I want to try something else. But my body was betraying me because um, anything research related journal clubs, any kind of extra activity around training that had to do with psychiatric knowledge, reading. I was a, still remained an obsessive reader. Uh, I would be there, you know, um, I would be the one showing up every single time and copying the papers. I remember I used to, uh, I, I don't know if the audience knows what copy cards are, but, uh, you know, these are these little plastic credit cards you need to pay for copies in a university library. I remember we would get a copy card each week or month and I would trade with my residents to make sure I got all of their copy cards simply so I could go back to the library, sometimes take a nap post call because I was sleep deprived, but then, you know, be able to copy more papers, uh, not for lack of money, but, you know, carrying a bunch of quarters around just and your scrubs just doesn't work. Uh, so anyway, I, you know, I was kind of, I was saying one thing, but my body was doing another thing. But then maybe more importantly, um, I got very interested in psychotherapy in residency. So while I thought I was heading to a program focused on medication, actually the, the program uh, at the time had a strong relationship with the Psychoanalytic Institute and uh, very specifically uh, Arnold Goldberg, who was a um, protege of a psychiatrist named Heinz Kohut, who uh, is now famous for um, his work in the area of narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, and I thought that training was really quite valuable and wound up spending a lot of my training time learning how to do psychotherapy. And back then you learned simply by doing and kind of screwing it up and getting supervision and trying again. Uh, so I was really clocking in pretty impressive hours for uh, psychotherapy each week. And the kind of patient I wound up seeing would be a referral, usually for medication non-response, you might call it treatment resistant bipolar disorder. But, you know, it didn't take uh, statistics to detect the trend that I was seeing uh, mostly young adults with pretty significant histories of trauma, recurrent suicide attempts, and what we might call uh, now borderline personality disorder, maybe complex PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder or some combination. And um, while the patients were fascinating, uh, at this time, this was uh, late 90s, the empirical literature was not very good. This was, uh, for those readers who are interested in mental health, this was uh, right before Marsha Linehan, uh, Marsha Linehan's work with dialectical behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorder really kind of revolutionized the field and legitimized it. It made it a treatable condition that improves and a kind of reasonable target for both like funding and empirical attention. So uh, to make a long story short, I thought, well, if this is the patient group I'm interested in, uh, then practice would essentially be research because um, there were no, F and there still are no FDA indications for these things. Research at the time was quite rudimentary. And so I thought if I'm going to do work in this area, it's going to be research anyway. And so when my training director pointed that out to me, it was a kind of, um, as if things had been decided for me, I would put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. Okay, so you, you talked about the field, you know, at the time when you were um, entering it and, and getting your start. Who or what um, is, you know, inspiring and, and exciting to you uh, in your field these days? Yeah, I, th I think generally what we're seeing is 
the 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 mixing of neuroscience, psychology, and psychiatry. Uh, you know, and that's being driven uh, as with all kind of large movements in science and society by multiple very strong factors. And all of these are really interesting, like um, the you know the need for improved mental health treatment. Even the COVID pandemic has contributed to a strong push for this. Um, but also other developments such as computer science and AI. So there are multiple very you know large and significant forces that are you know making these fields collide in very interesting ways, very helpful ways for the field. I, I would say I became a psychiatrist in spite of, you know, um, a perception that the public didn't quite trust psychiatry. I know, you know, in my undergraduate years, I was exposed to plenty of anti-psychiatric writing and philosophy. And so I think, I think things have changed a bit, but there still is some stigma about the field. And, you know, while un unfortunate, it's like many things in life, right? You uh, you don't know what's really going on until you look at it carefully. And so um, I think this is probably one of the most exciting times to be in psychiatry. Change is happening really quickly. Uh, so if you're interested in it from the scientific perspective, this is definitely a time of disruption. If you're interested in it from a clinical perspective, this is definitely a time where progress is being made. Um, and so when I think one can comfortably practice or do work in this area and, and feel, feel good about what you're doing. Okay. That's, yeah, it's very interesting to hear. So we're just curious, what are some of the, the more fun aspects of, of your current job and, uh, what are some of the less fun aspects? I mean, is, is there anything about being a professor that you don't particularly enjoy? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. So I, I tell, uh, my students and mentees that. I, I really do enjoy it. I, I'm not sure I thought I would. I was a little, as I said earlier, I kind of got pulled into medicine in a sense, somewhat skeptically. Uh, but I'm happy to report that I really enjoy most of my days. They don't feel long at all. Half of it is just the kind of interesting and nice patients, right? Like people, some psychiatric disorders really have these terrible reputations. Uh, and that's really not what it's like to work with people. Uh, so I work in an area of personality disorders, which frightens a lot of people. Um, but this is one of those things where you don't approach it like um, intuitively, right? You approach it with a layer of professionalism. So I feel like it's almost like surgery when I'm walking into the room. Uh, there's a kind of intentionality and a filter that I use uh, to maintain a helpful place like for myself, and also to be effective. So really, the clinical aspects are exciting. You know, research is, uh, there's just so much to say about it. Like, I think there's the beauty of nature aspect of it, right? Like where the results and the, the nature of the brain and mind, they're just it's quite remarkable, even if the results of the experiment aren't exactly according to your hypothesis. Another great irony for me is that many of the technologies and techniques used in, in neuroscience research are identical to what's used in like areas of my own interest outside of work, like electronic music. So like the difference between an analog synthesizer and an EEG amplifier or an electroconvulsive therapy device or a, a magnetic stimulator. Uh, you know, the knobs are labeled differently, essentially, but really the same same kind of physics is going on. So that's one of those kind of secret pleasures I have where things that I just like to do are very similar to my research life. So those are the things I like, uh, certainly. Um, with, with any career in academia, there is a constant tension between narcissism and realism. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think I can tell people, uh, certainly being somewhere in the middle is adaptive and being extremes on either of those could be adaptive too. Uh, and so the way I experience, I experience that in several ways. One is, you know, I, I really have to listen to my family when they give me feedback, like, uh, you're kind of talking to us like a professor. 
or or they might just say you're being narcissistic, right? Mm-hmm. And that's can, I think that can be my like work self or scientific self intruding in real life. And so that's something to really look out for. Yeah. Uh, the other way it can show up is uh, kind of, uh, st- you know, the, whatever standard you have for yourself, it, there is this kind of tension between narcissism and realism. Uh, you don't want to drive yourself too little. You don't want to drive yourself too much. I don't know what, where the right answer is. There are times where I feel mostly comfortable with it. And of course, there are times where it's painful. And I, I would say that's part of this kind of work. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I think um, th- those are some good things for people who are considering entering this field to keep in mind. Um, do you have any other like specific advice that you would give to someone who, who wanted to follow in your footsteps? Sure. Well, I, you know, when I talk to young people, what I, what I hear is very promising. So I think, I think the reasons that people want to become a psychiatrist are different today than they were 20 years ago. Hmm. Uh, or at least some of the reasons. So increasingly, psychiatry really has become a left brain, right brain field. And what I mean by that is when we evaluate uh, trainees like to bring to our program, you know, we're really looking for a person with both the analytic and scientific um, capability, as well as a really strong humanistic streak. Uh, because at the end of the day, whether you're in research or in the clinic, um, you really need to draw on both. And this did not used to be the way of psychiatry. I would say 30 years ago, um, maybe it was more important that you were strongly humanistic, right? Because you've got to just sit in the room. You have to listen to mm-hmm. be empathic. And then occasionally you're going to make a decision to order a brain scan or uh, test somebody's reflexes or order, a, you know, write a medication prescription. Uh, but these days, um, even clinical work, there's a lot of brain science in it. Psychopharmacology is getting more complex. Psychotherapies are increasingly manualized and complicated. So um, I would say if, if psychiatry is your interest, like a path like mine it's not a bad one to take, right? So if if you have divided interests and they seem paradoxical, uh, if you're headed towards psychiatry, I would say go with it. Don't don't try to resolve it too 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 much. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. That's um very very interesting insights there. Um, what is the most gratifying thing that you do in your field? In my field, the most gratifying thing. I think it's the sense of relief I can see or hear about when a person's uh, desire for trust is fulfilled. You know, this comes up a lot like with first uh, sessions with patients. Now, I talked about narcissism, so I I want to make sure that your audience knows I'm being careful about this. I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm a more effective psychiatrist than my peers. And I, I say that directly to patients to make sure they have realistic expectations. But I would say in this area that I'm spending and getting paid to study, right? I'm, I'm pretty confident in that area. And I'm pretty sure, you know, so like if you have an Audi, you need to go to, go to an Audi specialist, right? If you have a <laughs> Chevy, you should go to. So I'm kind of like that, right? So yeah. if somebody gives me a Chevy uh, and they they want to feel like, oh, this person really understands Chevys, I think I can provide that. And that feels nice. Like I, I um, that feels like all the training is worth it. All the time is worth it. That again, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, I have any gifts or uh, talents or secrets to make me more effective. But at least for what's masterable in the field, you know, I can feel I can feel some confidence there. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds uh, that sounds very rewarding. And um, all right, well, we're just about out of time. But uh, Professor Lee, thank you so much for joining me today on the course. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the others. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. See you around.